Okay. I think we're all ready and good to go. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and also to um, fellow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in this room. For those who don't know me, I am Georgia Burks. I'm an architectural graduate working up in Brisbane, and I'm also a proud descendant of the Kamilaroi and Dungari people up in northern New South Wales. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Sarah Lynn Reese, a Palawa woman, and Carol Gosam, a Dirubama peoples. Um, Carol is an architectural graduate as well, as also she is a researcher and a lecturer at the School of Architecture at the University of Queensland. Currently, she is leading um, indigenising the School of, School of Architecture's curriculum. And I have had the pleasure of being tutored by Carol um, during my studies at the university there. Sarah is also an architectural graduate at Jackson Clement Burroughs, but on top of this, she is also the curator of the Black Architecture series at the MP Pavilion. Um, she sits on a number of panels and advisory boards. Um, both are extremely talented and intelligent and for me personally role models and very inspiring um, and today they will be discussing the the way that indigeneity and gender intersect and um, advocacy groups and how they work alongside first nations peoples it will be a conversation that is probably a reflection and on their personal experiences in academia and in the profession itself um, so please welcome Sarah and Carol. I'll show you the audience. There they are. Are you okay? Are you all right? What's happening? <laughs> we'll start there. I'm sitting here very comfortably with my leg elevated on my couch, so welcome to my lounge, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, making the opportunity, well, working with your own injuries to be able to have this conversation today. Um, I'm going to try and navigate being up here all on my own um, with your wonderful face up here. Um, thank you, Georgia, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I guess maybe I'll kick off with a question. Does that work? Sure. Sure. Um, so, We've been having a few conversations before this session, just having a little bit of a yarn behind the scenes, talking about what we thought was important to say. And I guess the, the intersection of gender and indigeneity is a bit of a kind of red herring. It's not really something that we often talk about in public settings when we're talking about indigenous architecture. Um, whereas from indigenous perspectives, there's perhaps quite very strong roles between what a women, woman's role is in community and what a man's role is in community, at least traditionally. Um, and so the kind of conversations we've been having have been sort of around this and what are our own experiences. So maybe Carol, I'll ask you first, what, what is your experience in architecture as an indigenous woman? Favourite question of all time. Um, and do you think actually being a woman has impacted your capacity to act in this space as for positive or negative or and have you seen things change dramat dramatically over time? Right. Okay, so that's several questions there. So um, I'll tackle the first one which is how you know how have I sort of felt about being an indigenous woman in architecture. And I think I think when you're at the forefront of Indigenous people moving into a particular profession um, and there's such a minority of us that really we banded together as a collective and gender really took second place in, in that sort of issue in terms of, you know, being first Indigenous people um, in entering into the profession, studying, and often in different institutions. And so our collective identity of, of being the smallest of the minority of a minority um, was, was perhaps something that really took precedence over gender identity. But um, 
and and the challenges that come with being, you know, a, a woman in general, um, but then an Indigenous woman in really what is a, a dominant a dominant culture. So I think um, our collective objective was about how can we get Indigenous voice and Indigenous issues, planning, design and architecture into the mainstream. And and for me it entered through housing and I'm not quite sure if you experienced similar things. Uh, you would have had a range of different issues. Uh, but for me, the way that I entered into that space was to talk about something that was very close to my community experience, which is the lack of equity, uh, social equity and access to resources and in particular housing. And so, uh, and that was really a, a dominant issue for a number of decades um, in, in architecture and how architecture contributed do that in, a, in research, in improving design, in, in actually recognising that within Indigenous communities there were these sort of gender, different gender needs, different gender, you know, roles and obstacles and opportunities that each of us um, faced as, as a community in getting access to I guess, you know, that I'd like to perhaps pose a question back to you um, because, you know, that the, the concept of gendered identity is, is really challenging um, for Indigenous, Indigenous people um, in a sense of our identity, as I've mentioned, around housing is really about collective and social equity. And somehow that, how does that, that issue constantly um, consume other issues that are really are evident in the communities that we work in um, or work with and uh, the challenges that we have in, in trying to, to meet those needs. And, and I mentioned that my entry was into, into housing and when I entered into um, architecture but also into communities, the, the pr predominance of men taking the leadership um, and was, was, was really prevalent and it was... It was a, uh, essentially challenging for single gender issues to be addressed in housing. And so there was this hierarchy of um, how do we address Indigenous housing social need? Uh, and it really looked at people who who's, um, were differentiated within communities that had different needs and um, that were often sort of unaddressed. So people with disabilities, people with um, indigenous people with disabilities. Uh, the need for gender segregation in some remote communities. So single men's housing, um, for example, was an issue that was considered entirely irrelevant in the context of an overwhelming need generally for indigenous people. That's still typically the case, though. A lot of those houses in remote communities, they're not designed for the community's division of gender, where, for example, in some remote places, you've got uh, women's group, women's family units, you've got male family units that, as you said, aren't married, and then you've got married family units, but then the kids will sometimes go, um, once they reach puberty, they'll then split into these two different groups, or people that have been married who have had partners who have passed away. There's so many different social structures of what a family unit is that, and the different roles that people play in those positions that it's, that, yeah, you're right, exactly. That's been totally, hasn't been acknowledged in the delivery of housing in remote communities at all. 
uh, because the, the, the crisis, as it were, is the fact that there is a limited number of houses. It's a, sort of a, a negative cycle, really, if you think about it, because if you're not designing houses that people, uh, for the way people occupy space, then they're not going to sustain, they're not going to have a sustainable lifetime as we would expect a house normally would. And, and therefore you just keep ending up in this perpetual crisis cycle of needs for housing or whatever it may be. Um, I wonder, you were talking about men having the leadership and I think one of the conversations we've had, particularly, I mean, there's, there's not that many Indigenous people working in the built environment professions. And I know you've been compiling a list of who the students are and who might be working in the profession. Do you have any indication of what numbers we're talking about? Um, in, in terms of, I had this conversation actually with Jeeva in terms of, you know, number of registered Indigenous architects number of Indigenous students, male and female, studying architecture across the continent. And um, the perception was that in terms of the number of registered architects, it was, uh, I had this conversation with Dylan from the Barry too, and the numbers were around 20. Um, or less for registration and the number for graduates was around 50. That, that's a broad um, collective. So it's not just graduates in architecture, graduates in interior design, planning. We're capturing a lot of um, cognate disciplines in that, not architecture alone. And then probably across... Uh, yeah, across the continent, there could be students that are actually coming through the system and possibly numbering around um, perhaps uh, 50 as well. So I think the difficulty is, is that is that we're dispersed across a very great continent. Um, we don't have a... We don't have... Um, a really accurate set of records in terms of universities. Um, universities are reluctant in terms of privacy information to share that. So it's the way that we've gathered those numbers is just through colleagues and other Indigenous uh, students who've um, added people's names to the, you know, the Google list that, that I set up and I've told them to, you know, openly send that on to others to add names to the list. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not the most effective way um, to go about it, but I think there's some barriers there in terms of accessing information because of privacy issues and institutes being willing to share that data because certainly universities record um, students when they're not very Indigenous uh, because the Commonwealth requires that. Do you find that um, in your experience has been, like have you had strong female role models in the built environment or have, they, have your role models or the people that have been available to you, have they mostly been men? Um, in terms of the built environment, that's a great question actually. Um, well, my, my totally not role models actually for indigenous, for being indigenous women perhaps in, in housing and, and education and other fields um, in terms of, you know, female leadership and, um, and yes, and so, or, and then in generally indigenous leadership generally. Um, and then also non-indigenous uh, non-Indigenous uh, women as well. And I think, I think as a woman, you tend, to, you tend to sort of see that your way of being in the world is very different to, to men and in, indigeneity or being Indigenous doesn't sort of, you know, separate that. We have, we have shared similarities and, and issues that we confront and have to deal with, but also there, there are different sort of cultural obligations and 
norms and expectations that perhaps have, um, you know, create other demands on, on us. And so, um, yeah, my role models didn't really come from uh, the built environment at all. Uh, but not to say that I've, I've, I've not um, had great admiration and respect. But I think that when you're carrying, um, you know, uh, an expectation or a demand to actually uh, advance or um, in increase Indigenous voice, um, then sometimes you tend to be consumed by your, you know, the role models that you have within your Indigenous uh, network. And a lot of my um, network consists of 99% of people <laughs> who aren't in architecture. Yeah. What about yourself, Sarah? Um, I think, about, well, going through university, uh, I didn't really... Well, there was no sort of exposure to any sort of Indigenous architecture or what that might mean or that indigeneity was something that you could bring to architecture. Um, at least I wasn't exposed to it. I wasn't made aware of those sort of conversations at the time. Um, I think actually once I left Australia and then came back was when uh, there was this network, obviously, that you were talking about before of people who've been working in the profession, whether it's uh, built environment professions or academia, and you started started to be introduced to those, but it's it is quite ad hoc. Um, and maybe the best way I can answer this question is I was working with one of my um, colleagues, who is my direct manager, but you know you don't really call people managers in architecture. I don't know what the right term is, but she's great, love her. Um, and the I was talking about the fact that we were going to have this conversation at this conference, and. I was like getting really excited because to me, you are one of those role models. You are someone who I can look up to, who I can go to for advice um, from a sort of, from the cultural perspective as well as life advice. Whereas I've, I'm surrounded by so many wonderful women, many of them who are here in the audience today who have helped me out a lot um, over the course of the last sort of five, 10 years. Um, but the, the, there isn't that sort of cultural aspect. I can't, I love them dearly and I thank you all very much, but I, like, I can't go to you guys for a cultural conversation or to talk about something that's sort of nuanced and maybe complex or is a frustration that's felt because you're in a situation where there might be some, you know, Indigenous men who are not al who are aligning more with the patriarchal system than a non-patriarchal system. And so it's, it's nice to have that network and that community, which is challenging, as you say, reinforcing what you said, the fact that we're split across so far and there are so few women. There seem to be a lot more female students coming through though, which is exciting. I'm not sure if you've got any numbers on those, but um, it is any opportunity. I think the conversation before us was talking about the fact that once you get into a position of where you have a voice that you then, um, sort of turn around and go, okay, well, how can I help those that are coming up below me? And how, how can you sort of look in both directions, forward and back, and make everything better for anybody who's coming through next? But I don't feel like gender is a conversation we ever have. It, I, like going back to your first point, it very much is a conversation about indigenous matters um, mm. in general. And that nuance or the, like the slight, uh, that well, there is no new one. I mean, there is some new ones, but generally, it is a general conversation about how we can improve things for communities. Or you might have a specific project that will look at women. So we're looking at a project for a women's bush camp at the moment, which has very different requirements and requires there to be women involved in the design of it because there's certain conversations that can't be shared from men. Men can't hear women's stories. Women can't hear men's stories. And so, even those sort of um, dynamics have never really existed before uh, in our understanding of how to practice architecture. And maybe you can talk about this a bit from your experience in research, particularly um, the work you've done previously where you sort of, you see where this, um, these protocols of your gender play out in certain situations. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I guess this my, I mean, my cultural background is that I'm from North Queensland. 
And um, and that has a huge bearing on the understanding of indigenous culture and and like gaining about the diversity of indigenous culture is actually very meaning with Queensland and realising um, that the complexity of Indigenous Australia um, and coming in, coming from the, a really small rural town, the city essentially, uh, you know, for, for what I felt was no evident sense of um, the community uh, that I had in North Queensland, and that and that was. Um, and that took me some time to realise that there were pockets of Indigenous people in the, that, that had some standards, but generally the community that I came from, everyone was connected through kin. You had kin terms for everybody. Um, someone was either your uncle or your auntie or your... Um, and, you know, you knew where everyone fit in terms of even, you know, different different neighbouring language groups and we had terms of respect for them. So it, it was, um, and that, when I moved from North Queensland uh, to Brisbane in my 20s, that was my experience. And then now I had to learn an urban, um, you know, understanding of how the black community as a collective worked and how it worked through Indigenous organisations and the, and the, the wonderful and powerful things that they were doing across a whole range of sectors and under leadership. And so, um, and when I then studied architecture and then moved into research, it was then taking myself to different locations, uh, some remote communities, some extremely remote communities, which had, you know, uh, Semblances of, of the culture that I came from that I recognised were very, very different in, in, in a lot of ways in terms of they still had, still had some sacred, secret rituals and, um, and gender separations that extended into those sacred, secret uh, spaces and stuff and, and how that affected um, my you know, my ability to work in those spaces. And so I often predominantly work with women and with women only, um, not uh, not as a, as a female, with one-on-one with, -on -one with men. Um, and that was uh, for, the, for the gender se segregation and separation for particular issues, even around housing, um, was very, very, um, you know, strict. And that began to break down over the sort of 20 or 30 years that I worked um, in remote places. And then when I lived and worked in uh, Alice Springs, uh, there were meetings and organisations that had Indigenous men, men and women on boards and, uh, and coming together around, you know, issues of housing and a whole range of things. And so... I think the, the um, changing face of Indigenous Australia in the context of social inequity and advocacy for the resources and for maintaining resources became the most predominant issue um, in my working life. But I could definitely see in issues within Indigenous organisations that a lot of the things that women face in terms of, um, you know, power and control were in Indigenous organisations and um, and expressed in, in, in different ways, you know, so, and challenging, and challenging women within those organisations as well. Um, Indigenous women who were uh, leading particular departments or programs and so, that's where the similarity of disempowerment of, of women or male control um, certainly uh, became problematic. But in the context of in the context of this overall demanding agenda 
keep fighting for Indigenous resources and, and how a whole range of men always became the predominant and, and gender issue that we became um, pushed down, down further and that was over, overwhelming demand. And I think that in my research I've found like if you know, that's that's when I entered into that space and um, in the early nineteen nineties and now coming to currently, you know, I think about some of the issues of in indigenous inequity is still so prevalent and, and somehow gender becomes um, subservient to that. But issues that indigenous communities face are definitely around, you know, gender violence, um, um, family violence, a whole range of things, um, but also positive things of, of health and, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, women's advocacy for a range of things or art or all these, all these issues you find or you know, opportunities still come down to fighting of indigenous people fighting for resources and and, um, and support economically um, for programs, much much uh, new programs, and so um, and I think it's it, it helps you understand when things like you know the SOS Black Advocacy, uh, Black Australia Advocacy, which was about the um, online collective of Indigenous uh, women saying, book setting up um, how we can make, you know, the community closes in the Northern Territory in Western Australia become an issue bigger than um, Indigenous Australia and the join and um, get people to, you know, to support and rally, you know, for um, the viability and the recognition of uh, funding issues. And then, you know, I'm really heartened to see that remote grassroots movements like, you know, the Saint Santa Teresa uh, from Aranda people in, in Alice Springs, where 70 households had 70 households in Santa Teresa community um, through the Northern Territory government for its inattention to over 600 requests for repairs and maintenance on wow. um, nursing. So... That's pretty phenomenal, <laughs> in just in general. Um, I wonder maybe if you could talk about your experience of what people expected of you over the course of your life from the perspective of being Indigenous and being a woman and how you saw that in comparison to other people around you. Um, I think I think in research it, it it becomes you know when you're working on indigenous projects I think um, it was about trying to make sure that it wasn't through a non-indigenous filter the perception of what was happening in indigenous communities that indigenous voice really did shine through in terms of perception, first of all, of the problem definition, um, but also of the proposed solutions and that Indigenous people were front and centre. And I think when you work for a uh, really amazing, strong um, Indigenous organisations like Tungandjira Council and Central Land Council um, in Central Australia, uh, when you work for... Uh, but, you know, organisations that might have a, their, their modus might be housing or land, but actually their, their remit is really, really incredibly broad, so much beyond what they're actually often funded for. And that is similar with um, Indigenous health organisations. Um, so I think when I saw how those organisations operated and operated effectively using media, a whole range of things to uh, ensure that conditions were heard. Um, and also that 
indigenous advocacy issues and um, this perpetual cycle of um, trying to get funding um, and indigenous voice represented in how the story was told um, and not filtered through, you know, um, binaries or, you know, presenting Indigenous people, even in that sort of overwhelming context, has been always disempowered. But being empowered in lots of ways of shining a light on a lot of the really positive and amazing and innovative things that Indigenous organisations are doing in the context of sort of this slow drip through the um, government funding. What about your personal experience, though? You, um, as an individual growing up, what was the expectation on you? Oh, my ex the expectation, yes. So I left that to get out of the <laughs> conversation there. Um, I guess, I guess, you know, like I, you know, I, felt, I was reflecting on this, and I think that the, this whole um, session within translations um, really prompted me to think about it because I grew up in the era, and and I think I find this really different. Um, from yourself, Sarah, and I find that with younger women, it's like the fact that architecture was an, you know, was an open up option for you amongst many um, is where I greatly differed. I grew up in an, in, in an era of low expectations, you know, so the expectations for me, um, you know, were not even, to, you know, the expectations and some of them were were negative, and I'm not saying this is from my family, but from broader society, was that I would not complete any schooling and um, and you know work for a few years and then become fettered to family and children, and um, and that was my you know expectation, and but also educationally. You know, achieving anything, um, there were incredibly low expectations. And and when I entered into university, and perhaps to illustrate that, was that when I entered into university at UQ, um, I was the only Indigenous woman who was in a studying a profession that wasn't social work or health, not education. And so. Um, Predominantly, even though, you know, um, most Indigenous women, I guess, entered into university aware that there were ready jobs in, in Indigenous organisations that could, um, or opportunities within government that would employ them. And so, um, but in that, um, of the, of the um, women that entered university with me by the six months 50 percent dropped out um and the remaining uh was still you know persisting with their studies and i was um slogging along in, in architecture and so the concept of um you know me completing was you know it was an incredible um you know, uh, focus of energy to actually complete and succeed with study, because in in that in that environment of even though you know I used to go to the Yatsi unit and we would have indigenous um, support networks um, to find a declining number of raw indigenous cohort disappearing. Um, was really um, showed you how how challenging education was uh, for you know, that that first sort of major wave of Indigenous people studying at university, which was in the uh, late eighties. And for me personally, I think the challenge has always been that. Um, I've carried the banner not so much as an Indigenous woman, but more so as, you know, uh, trying to sort of see Indigenous 
contribution um, beyond, you know, social, beyond social issues. And I think that, you know, the contribution um, of Indigenous design, and I see a lot of those designs, even though that they're designed in conjunction with you know, Indigenous people, that when the consultation process has been something that's sound and, and you know, I see them as Indigenous people's um, opportunity to express their cultural identity through the built environment as being just as important and that, that they are co-facilitators and co-designers to on Indigenous architects. And that, I think, then design shift beyond the institutional confines of housing, health um, and education that it opened um, for me an opportunity to, to, to do further advocate for um, architecture to be a part of the school curriculum, um, uh, the university school curriculum. And, and you know, it's, it's really essentially happened, you know, for me personally, I've, I've taught in and out of um, architecture since the, uh, the late 1990s, but not specifically with this, you know, um, you know what I'm doing now at, at the University of Queensland, which is I'm running a studio and also teaching an Indigenous um, themed research selective. And, um, and I think my own maturity as a researcher and a teacher uh, was where those two things met. Prior to that, I was doing friends with me, um, Order indigenous things and just few things to work had. Um, it had uh, indigenous architecture, but it started with certainly only teaching um, Aboriginal housing. Mm. Aboriginal housing. I think the bell rang, so perhaps we've got time for some questions. Yeah? If anybody's got a question? Thank you, Carol. Hi, thank you both for sharing your experiences. It was really um, wonderful conversation. And I was wondering if you found yourselves um, connected to a global indigenous community in any way, um, if you found any support or strategies or commonalities um, between the experiences of um, being an indigenous architect, woman architect in Australia compared to other countries or continents. Sure, um, I'll uh, jump in with this one first, uh, absolutely. Um, there's a great uh, cross-section of interaction between Indigenous, particularly I found women. Um, I've got great relationships with people from Aotearoa, New Zealand, Maori architects down there. You saw some photos beforehand of us at another parlour event talking. Um, and it's, it is actually events like these where the, the two of you sort of get put together and you become friends through solidarity, solidarity of experience even though you're from different places, but you've gone through, you, you belong to a community that's been colonized. And so you automatically have a solidarity with someone in that situation. Your, you know, your nuance of your life experiences might be slightly different, but it becomes someone, you, you form a community uh, in that moment and then moving forward. I've got a WhatsApp group um, with a bunch of beautiful uh, indigenous women and non-indigenous women, but women of color who face all these sort of uh, experiences that we have over the course of our everyday lives and it becomes a safe space to share that information, to let out a little bit of frustration, to be angry, but to be angry in a way that's not going to then impact people being able to hear what you have to say. Like a lot of the time in these kind of events, like if we're angry, then people stop listening. Um, and I think that goes definitely for women, but maybe even more so just for indigenous people in general. Um, that nobody expects us to, to be sort of, well, that's generalizing, but expects us to be opening and welcoming. 
Um, and there's a reason for that. There's been a lot of disenfranchisement. There's been a lot of uh, sort of theft of knowledge and authority and certain things over time. But um, yes, is the simple answer to that question. I, in my experience, 100%, there's a massive international community and it's always warming when you're welcomed into something that you're not necessarily a part of in any other situation. It's nice to have those sisters overseas. <laughs> I think, I think um, I've, I've had similar experiences as well and, and perhaps our, our close close links to um, AFR in uh, New Zealand, um, it has been, been perhaps the, the closest link. Um, people like, you know, uh, Dinky Brown and then up and coming um, young uh, Tongan, uh, Tongan and other Pacific Indigenous uh, women in architecture, um, collectively supporting each other, not only as women, but just uh, as um, women within the profession. And, and, but also, you know, that network does extend um, to, you know, map, you know uh, Indigenous males across uh, the world and women as well, you know, so in Canada, Nate architects um, and and also in in the United States. So those opportunities are um, are rarer, I guess, and, and they're closer. You know, I feel like there's a closer link in coming together of as Indigenous people in terms of um, you know the surprisingly similar challenges that we have. Um, around a whole range of social equity issues, you know, um, also in, in, in trying to sort of um, get research presented in a way that really um, shows the Indigenous narrative and the Indigenous voice and um, so that it comes through in, in, in research and seeing examples of, of Different women, uh, uh, the work and the research that they're doing um, in similar fields is, is just really, you know, warms your heart in terms of you know, feeling part of this. Have we got time for one more question? Thank you for both those. That was um, super interesting to hear your sort of thoughts and experiences. Um, I work for an architectural practice and indigenous culture is at the forefront of a lot of what we try and think about. Um, and we were having a conversation yesterday about how to be more inclusive, even coming down to our recruitment. So it's more a piece of advice than a question. Um, what, what do you think that we can do to be more inclusive from that standpoint and really harness uh, the indigenous female skill and candidates that are out there. Sorry, what was that question? So how, how do we, um, what do we do as a practice to really um, catch indigenous uh, candidates and, and harness the skills that are out there? Right, okay. Um, in our, you know, so indigenous candidates in architecture, sorry. In yes. That, you know, in, when they presenting practice uh, for work or looking for work. I think you're talking more about recruitment. How do you yeah. encourage young Indigenous people into the profession? Perhaps? Precisely, yeah. And then how do you uh, then support them in the office? Precisely. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I think, you know, my experience is, I'm not quite sure, Sarah, maybe you can talk to these. Um, my experiences were, um, I had, I had, I had worked in a, a range of small practices uh, and then uh, worked in a, in a consultancy practice uh, with my then husband and um, for a number of years. And um, when I did when I did go for work, a lot of people would look at my CV and say, well, what's all this Indigenous stuff on your CV? What, what's this interest that you have? Because they didn't often see me as being Indigenous. 
and then um, saw it as incredibly irrelevant to practice. And I think that's, that's so different uh, now. And um, But I think it, it was really difficult to get that, um, you know, because, pe because practices see what can you contribute commercially to their commercial goals and their commercial outcomes you know, uh, their commercial improvement, not some sort of minor social issue which has no relevance to mainstream practice. And I think that's a very different world. But I think what, um, profession, what the profession could do is that I don't know if young people um, need as much support, um, but, you know, when they do get work, uh, you know, I was really heartened by Sarah's story where she actually pitched back to the practice and said, this is what I'm going to bring and this is what I would like. And that would that certainly wasn't something that I was doing when I was uh, applying for jobs. I was like, please, please give me a job. Um, so the, the, the differences uh, were greater. But when Indigenous people are, are leaving university and leaving it at a, at a competitive level and not as just the sole Indigenous person entering into practice, that can be an, an added commercial advantage now for practices where when I was entering the profession, it was not necessarily seen as, uh, as a commercial advantage. But um, I'm, I don't want to sort of think of things just in terms of economic contribution, but I think the... Um, opening up of the profession itself in a much more inclusive way of, um, you know, incorporating in, in Indigenous issues and a whole range of issues into the practice and become a part of the whole thing that sets those practices apart because uh, the, the work and the opportunities are only increasing and they're increasing because governments are now um, making these core elements of major infrastructure um, and, and architectural programs and revisionings of space to include an Indigenous, an Indigenous element, at least within Australia. And so it becomes something that, that can be critical, but there is needs to be this recognition that there are multiple um, indigenous identities and sociologies that um, people can then sort of garner and, and utilise um, in, in, in practice. I think if I can answer your question uh, from my perspective, which is, is different to yours because I have sort of come into architecture at a time where all of a sudden it is something on the table to have a discussion topic about. And there is a bit of currency in that in terms of um, being able to, like Carol said, turn around to my employer who's offering me a job and go, yeah, I'll come work here, but I want to make sure the office is culturally competent. I want to make sure that we uh, engage in Indigenous architecture and that we have this conversation. And it's going to take us a long time, but that's what I'm interested in doing. And they'll turn around and go, great, let's do it. Um, obviously, there's not that many Indigenous people working in architecture, so you don't necessarily have um, not that I would call myself a champion, but the example of that bit, someone championing it from an Indigenous perspective in every office, you can't have that. Um, you still can have champions who are non-Indigenous who um, uh, make an, an active decision to educate the office in whatever way they can um, and to create a, a sort of strategic plan about engagement. But I think in terms of encouraging young people into the profession, it needs to happen well before uh, recruitment. It needs to happen with people, with students in high school, like Indigenous students need to be exposed to what architecture is. Uh, and then they need to be supported through university uh, where the curriculum reflects who they are uh, so that they can actually feel like what they're doing is, is part of their own history rather than representing other people's histories that aren't their own. Um, and then there also needs to be support ne networks within the universities to make sure that people, students have a safe place to go, whether it is an Indigenous student centre or whether it's someone within the faculty that you can go to and, and sort of ask advice from uh, without feeling like you're going to be penalised for it. Um, and then you need 
role models, you need people in practice who are standing up and, and talking um, about these sort of matters, whether it be in forums like this or whether it be in you know, a podcast or whatever it is. Indigenous voices so that people feel like they can see themselves within the profession. Um, and then once you are perhaps a non-Indigenous practice with no one Indigenous in it who wants to look at hiring an Indigenous person coming through to support them, what you can do, well, you can support all of those things that have happened beforehand by exposing Indigenous people to architecture early in their career. You can support universities with whatever programs they might have, whether it's financial or whether it's offering mentorship um, to students coming through. And then once it comes time for them to be employed, then you can uh, create an environment where you acknowledge the fact that you probably don't know all the nuances of what's going on and you'd like to create this space with that young person coming through, offer them specific mentorship and in return try to incorporate whatever their thoughts are in regards to anything Indigenous into the practice. Um, I, I think that's probably, does that maybe answer the question? Yeah, that's perfect, thank you. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be done at a lot of different stages, I think that's the point, but we can all do something, whether it's a financial, whether it's mentorship, whether it's um, just acknowledging that we don't know everything. Like, I think you invited us up here and you called us experts, and I was like, oh, God, I'm not an expert. Um, can't speak on behalf of anybody else's experience or culture except for my own, and I'm sure I'm an ex expert in my own experience, but that's about it. <laughs> um, yeah. How are you doing for time? Oh, I just wanted to just sum up and add just to that, and I won't take up a, a huge amount of time, but I just thought that uh, what you were saying, Sarah, that you were talking to, you know, um, a really important set of procedures and, and steps along the way. But I think the greatest thing that Indigenous, um, you know, students or because um, there's programs like, you know, that university have like Inspire You Camps, which inspire, you know, uh, we have that at UQ where Indigenous students can come and be exposed to architecture, engineering and a whole range of things. Um, but when, um, when students um, leave, uh, you know, or are looking for work, they're looking for practice experience as well to make so that they can, they can gain the proficiencies that they need to operate within the we're no different to any other um, architectural graduate. Everyone needs to gain their skills. And, um, and so, like, you know, having a supportive environment within practices that really foster and um, grow students' um, growth pattern as they're acquiring their skills and competencies is... is important for Indigenous and non-Indigenous students as well. And so um, it's not every Indigenous person wants to, to be a person who heralds for in Indigenous issues and uh, want to be architects and maybe um, work within the profession um, but, but, and become, you know, competent um, within the profession. Thank you, Carol. I think that's probably a very good place to end. Um, so um, please join me in thanking Carol and Sarah, and particularly for navigating the complexities of the presentation. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to end up leaving you here, Carol. I don't know what's happening. I'm just going to go over this way. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a very generous conversation. We wish you were with us. <laughs> anyway, she can't hear me. Um, okay, lunch. Now, we go, I think we're going to ask you to eat quickly so we can get back on time. Um, so, uh, please, uh, make your way to...